I think we resolved all of our computer problems. I think you can hear me and I'm gonna confirm before I make a fool of myself real quick. Yeah, you can hear me. So we fixed our sound problems, which were 100%. I blamed Windows 100% caused by me. Uh, all of my computer problems uh, besides one was caused by me and myself. I'll explain that soon, but welcome to Mastermind Academy. Happy Thursday, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Welcome to part four of, uh, oh yes, th those lines are supposed to be flickering on my screen. Um, yeah, that's, that's the background. Um, but welcome to part four of Contained, a deep dive into Docker. Um, we're gonna have some fun tonight doing some cool stuff. Yeah, this is just a little active background that I have. Um, I thought it was cool. I don't, I mean, I don't know who made this, but I thought it was pretty dope. Um, so you are supposed to be seeing that all good lines flickering and everything. How you doing tonight? Sin city. What's up? ACD games. Your first congratulations score. Uh, there's a first, uh, there's a first comment scoreboard coming soon. Um, just for fun. Uh, we kind of made it a little bit of a thing. But I'm just getting set up here. Make sure you hit that exclamation point contained to get to the slides. Um, but we're gonna go do some fun stuff tonight and I don't actually think we'll take up the whole two hours tonight. Um, I think the concepts tonight uh, are, um, they're, I think they're interesting. I think they're a step up from kind of what we've learned so far. So they're kind of, uh, they're definitely not advanced Docker concepts, but they are, they're just, uh, you know, I think they're a little bit bigger um, and they, they they dive a little more deeply into uh, the style of your implementation. So yeah, TD Roke, oh, congratulations. Congratulations. I am proud of you. That's awesome. Past the AWS certified cloud practitioner. You are now certified to practice in the cloud. Great job. That's pretty dope. That's pretty awesome. Um, I'm interested to know how the, uh, the take home, like I know they're doing it online now. That's pretty cool. Uh, I'm, I need to sign up. I keep saying I'm going to do it. I'm going to sign up for my solutions architect pro, but congratulations. We will, uh, see, we need a congratulations board as well. Let me put this in my notion real quick. All the things that I'm supposed to do that I never make it around to do. That's amazing. We need to celebrate these things, whatever, anybody, if you, any kind of accolades, you get anything you pass, whether you pass, whether you fail, people need to know when you fail as well. Um, come through, let people know how your experience was uh, so that we can get even more hype for you and cheer you on, uh, make sure that you get through it. But that is amazing. And I'm really proud, that's, that's awesome. Shoot, I need, to, I need to go get me some certs, uh, step my game up. Um, let me just put this over here. All right, so tonight, uh, let me pull up the slides. Uh, like I said, tonight we have about three topics. Um, we're gonna take our time with them. Also, the music's a little bit different. There's a new synth wave playlist. I gotta play music that is not gonna get me copyright striked on YouTube. So I can only use the free playlists that are available. Um, and so I found, uh, I found some dude named Harris Heller, who, uh, you know, I just use his playlist and I've been using the, the lo-fi one, but I'm, I'm channeling my inner, uh, what's the show on Netflix? My inner Stranger Things, uh, you know, the 80s synth wave uh, music along with the backgrounds, you know, really, really the neon colors. And uh, we're, we're gonna we're gonna test it out. We're gonna see how we like it this evening. Hopefully the Twitch won't get hacked and ask for Bitcoin donations. Uh, yes, uh, hopefully if it happens on my Twitter, um, I'm fine, but hopefully my Twitch will not uh, do that. And what's really funny about that is I saw, I, I like I've seen uh, Elon Musk's account do that, uh, and I was like, huh. Like, I can't tell if like this is like a, a side account that like you know like it's meant to be his, but I was like, it looks like his account. Uh, so it's pretty interesting when when that article came out about all the accounts that got hacked um, and what they've been using them for. Pretty interesting. I would have used it for something bigger than that, to be honest. Uh, you know, I mean, they could have made some money. You know, I'm sure some people fell for it but I would have, you know, I would have done something a little more grand, to be honest. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, 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 people, people never cease to amaze me. They really don't. Um, I, yeah, I, they'll never, I'll never be surprised anymore um, that people are doing crazy things. So let me get over here. Let me hit the exclamation point uh, contained. Let me grab the notion page. Oh no, this needs to go back up here. 
where I lose everything that I need. This needs to come over here and let's go day four. And let's click on the slides for day four. Hey, I love it, Frosted. Hey, yes, I, I love it, Frosted Donut. Coming in with the energy. Time to turn up on the Docker. Let's go. I do love Docker. Uh, surprisingly, today, um, like I said, I don't usually get to get hands on with. Uh, I haven't been getting super hands on with a lot of the things that I love, including Docker. Uh, but this past week, actually, um, especially today, uh, we're doing a little project. Um, and it's 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 one of our few applications that's still doc that's still containerized. Uh, we, we we actually we actually went the you know containers were the intermediate route for us. We went from uh, kind of standard on prem stuff and we containerized it and ran it a certain way. And then all the things that we could containerize, we actually uh, converted into serverless. And so we still have a few containerized things. And one of the big tools that we have uh, needs some special pieces. And I spent a lot of time doing some cool container stuff today. Uh, so I was pretty excited about it. So, you know, I'm, I have been messing around uh, with Docker today and I did in fact do all of it right here on Windows, which is pretty exciting to me, to be honest. Um, you know, it worked out really well. Like I'm really trying to give it a go. I'm really trying to understand what the caveats are. And so far, so far, all the caveats have just been things that I'm, I just wasn't hip to. Um, and like, they're not really problems. They're just, yeah, they're just kind of things that you got to deal with when you're, uh, you know, going in between Windows and Linux, but they're pretty few and far between. So give people, you know, another couple of minutes. I have no announcements for you all, uh, none at all. Just again, I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep saying it until the actual announcement comes out about uh, the two excursions that are following this one, these two. Uh, so at the end of next week, the start of that following week will be Git. Um, and also will be, uh, Git and, and Terraform will be the next two, uh, probably followed by Ku uh, a, a Kubernetes one that might take up all of the time. It might be two to three weeks uh, straight Kubernetes um, for because again, I, I want the Kubernetes one to be um, applicable, um, completely uh, scenario based uh, rather than just teaching. Um, and then the uh, journeys will likely start up around at that time, probably right around the beginning of September is when the journeys will start back up with level twos of the ones that we just went through. Um, so level two of the software engineering, level two of the cloud computing uh, and pipelines will begin back up at the same time. Um, other than that, uh, if anyone um, is, is interested in learning uh, Go, uh, there's an organization called GoBridge. Uh, they used to do a lot of in-person things when we could meet in person we can no longer do that uh so i just put in i'm going to be hosting uh probably two go bridge workshops um not just teaching um they're going to be a little a little bigger than that so we'll be doing the teaching on twitch but there will probably be a discord as well as two zooms uh that have breakout rooms so that people can kind of work together uh so that people aren't just kind of on their own um off to the side so keep an eye out for that that probably won't be until mid-september either uh maybe one maybe the beginner one might be in august um because there are probably two levels of that as well those are usually on the weekend um like all day um and you kind of just take people from zero to hero with the language really help people get introduced so if you know someone who's trying to just get a kickstart into their tech career and uh or, or just trying to learn go um keep an eye out for that information that will be coming out pretty soon as well Dockerized code signing today and container hardening with multi-stage Docker builds this week. That's pretty great. So I did a little more research on, on multi-stage Docker builds um, after we talked last time uh, before going into this piece, just to learn a little bit more. And I guess the thing is that it is exactly what I thought it was, but I think the way that people so passionately talk about multi-stage Docker builds, I thought there was, I don't know. I thought the payoff was bigger. The, the payoff is big, but I thought it was a little bit bigger, but we'll talk about that tonight. Uh, Ikunakin, welcome. You're new to the channel. Good to have you. What do you develop on? I apologize for the basic type of question. No, apo no apologizing at all. I have AWS Solutions Architect Associate. First off, that's amazing. That's excellent. Congratulations for getting that. Um, but we do all kinds of things. So I'm a DevOps engineer. Uh, I do a lot of cloud computing automation. Uh, but we do 
uh we're on this channel we do everything that supports uh dig digital delivery software delivery so uh so we do software engineering we do cloud computing specifically uh we do all kinds of automation all the devops tooling we actually do a devops boot camp called pipelines as well devops like sre boot camp called pipelines uh so there are there's also a web development one coming along called uh domination um which is on the way as well but it's just going to be uh, it's going to end up being all of the disciplines again that support uh software development and software delivery uh because that's what people get paid so much for uh even the non-technical ones per se uh like product management uh and and well this one it is technical but the ux ui uh, i probably will not be doing those but um, i'm trying to find a way to incorporate um uh, kind of all of those things into uh, into mastermind academy um, but we'll do we do all kinds of different tools that fall into the space so you know everything we're gonna start building some some things as well like one thing we haven't been doing is building things uh we've kind of been doing a lot of learning but we'll definitely uh we'll definitely be doing that but yeah devops is also my interest so a lot of what we do here there's a lot of devops stuff going on that's the stuff that i know the most um so yeah so we're talking about a lot of that so we'll hop right into it tonight we are here with contained docker deep dive day four of six what are we going to be learning today we are going to be learning about docker networking basics so what first off let's take a step back what have we covered so far we've covered you know what docker is how to get it installed um we've learned how to manage run and manage containers so we know how to run a container once we have an image we know how to run it we know some of the different flags that we can pass in uh we know you know we know how to manage that we know how to manage the containers we know how to start them stop them create them uh we know how to delete them we know how to see what's running uh we also have learned how to manage the images so we know how to list images we know that uh, we know how to pull images from docker hub we know how to delete them we know how to log in and push images up if we need to. We know how to build images as well using Docker files. We've learned um, what Docker files are. We've learned uh, a lot of the standard commands inside of Docker files, the from, the run, the, the CMD, the copies, the ads. Uh, we haven't done a lot of practice with it yet, but we've learned a lot of those things. So we understand that you can use a Docker file to build a Docker image, um, and you, then you can use that image to deploy any number of containers. Uh, and tonight, um, well, we learned a couple other things as well, but tonight we're gonna be talking about Docker networking basics. Uh, we'll be diving into entry point, um, really entry point versus, uh, uh, that's on view only, um, entry point versus CMD, entry point versus commands. Uh, and we'll also be talking about multi-stage Docker builds tonight. Um, so we'll get real hands on and what is up the real Earl of Argyle. Good to have you. Welcome to the channel. <laughs> so good to see you. All right, so let's move on. Let's let's get it going. We'll get hands on. We'll get right into uh, creating these things. So, Docker networking. Now, when you're running Docker alone, like when you're when you're when you're at a point where you're just uh, using Docker for development or trying to run some things, um, Docker networking it's important. But you probably will not use anything besides the standard um but you should be familiar with these and it is helpful um in different situations to know what these are docker network expands past what we're going to talk about tonight we will talk about that stuff not we probably will talk about all that in the kubernetes uh more orchestration sections uh as we as we move on from here um we'll talk a little bit about uh, overlay networks when we talk about uh docker compose and swarm i think next time uh but yeah we're gonna go over the the basic stuff right now so your network is your net worth. People say it all the time, it's a cliche term. It means nothing here. I just put it at the top because it sounded good. And over on the left, we have someone struggling to do some networking and get all the ethernet uh, cords in the right places, uh, but networking and networks. Um, Docker uh, does a lot of this for you. Networking is relatively complicated. Uh, the re network is relatively complex. It is what allows uh, the type of computing we know about uh, to happen. Um, it's, it's, it's really cool, but Docker handles a lot of it underneath for you. Uh, but Docker has a, a, a managed network service that you can use to uh, to distribute things, to be able to grant access or no access to things, as well as um, to give you um, a way to, you know, to, to a way to allow traffic to flow through your containers. Um, and so the same way that we have 
those managed volumes that we talked about when we talked about the the volume mounts that docker gives you and manages those for you uh it does the same thing for networks um and we can run some networking commands to see that so if we want to see some docker networks we can simply run docker network ls so let's hop in to the command line real quick and let's check this out a little bit so if i run docker networks no s sorry docker network you get the little help readme file thing here that says hey run docker network command and this is to manage your docker networks uh, and so you can do a couple different things and these look very similar to what we learned when we were doing the images and so what you can do is you can uh connect to a network that already exists you can create a new network if you need to. You can disconnect from a network, disconnect a container from a network. You can inspect uh, networks. And remember that inspect command on containers gives you that JSON information about that container. Inspect uh, does that about the networks. Uh, LS allows you to list the networks and prune, remove all unused networks and RM remove one or more networks. So a lot of the paradigms that we've already seen again with some of the other features in Docker. And so I'm gonna do a Docker network LS and see what is available again. It's network, not networks. Um, these are, uh, I have some test networks here, uh, just messing around. Um, I wanted to see if, since this is WSL2 and this is actually a Docker desktop for Windows. I was doing some testing to see um, how, if the networking worked exactly the same. So far, it appears that networking works exactly the same uh, as it does normally. So, Docker network LS, that's how you can see what networks you do have available to you now. Let's go ahead and let's create our own network for tonight that we can use for some of the things that we're gonna do. And so we're gonna do Docker, let's actually clear this out. Docker network create uh, we're gonna call this contained contains got its own network and we are here to use it so docker network create real simple very fast we get uh a network id um right on out of there and how do we see what networks we have available to us docker network ls and list it out and uh, look at this right here we have a new network right here uh take a look at the drivers his bridge Keep that in mind now we're gonna learn about that scope local and the id is over here so this is the unique id we can use as well as the name to talk about this network here but we now have a managed network uh from docker now what other options do we have here um if we wanted to see a little bit more about this we have this nice inspect command here and let's use the inspect command and see what information we can find out about our network. So Docker, network, inspect, and then you have to give it the name of the network you wanna inspect or the, the ID of it, um, but I don't know the ID, so I'm gonna you know, do the one that I know easier to type. No need to copy and paste. And we get a bunch of output, but let's, um, let's clear that. And let's do it again and let's get a little color in there and let's take a look at what we have here so we have this json this uh this javascript object notation output we have a bunch of keys and values so one of the keys here is name and the name is contained the id is this bad boy right here a very long id we have when it was created which is right here we have the scope local driver bridge enabled ipv6 uh we have not talked about we haven't talked about networking or anything here um but you have some options here um but this is all the information that you would need about the network uh you can see the subnets uh that were created what what um you know what is the subnet here so this was given 172.30.0.0 um, and we'll talk about why it gets that uh, well, it, it, bridge networks uh, kind of get this internal IP address range. This slash 16 right here um, is in reference to something called a cider block. It's a way to it's a way to to to, to uh, allocate and to um, to 
codify kind of uh, IP address bl blocks and ranges. And this is actually, this actually references something like 65,000 addresses or something like that. Uh, something, some absolutely large number. So allocated to this network alone, there are like 65,000 internal IP addresses that can be used, which is really cool. Um, but there's just some good information here about the network. This is not gonna be a networking course at all, uh, but just, if you need to find out some information about a network in Docker, that's one way you can do it. So, whoops, I don't know why I did that. Uh, so Docker network LS and we can, man, I cannot type tonight. Network LS and those are the things that are here. I'm actually going to, uh, let's actually see. Let me pull this back up. Uh, all right, so we created a network with the create command and you can remove a network. I'll remove uh, these other two networks real quick with Docker network RM. So we're keeping around uh, very similar uh, things here. So if I do Docker network RM and just to jog your memory a little bit, what other uh, what other thing or resource uh, uses that we know about so far uses RM for deletion? Docker network RM and we'll delete test and that removes test for us and test one. And if we do a Docker network LS, those two are gone. We still have contained here, but the resource that uses RM is containers. Containers use RM to remove a container. Images remember are RMI. Um, so yeah, that's the difference there. RMI is for removing an image. RM for a container, Docker network RM is also for um, also for a volume as well and for network as well here. So we we'll remove those so we can see which which networks we have available to us with the LS command with Docker networks LS. We can see uh, we can create a network with Docker create and the name of the network Docker network create name of the network and we can remove the network uh, like that now. Um, the thing about removing networks, you know, it seems like everything here has some kind of caveat when we are removing things. Uh, networks, you can remove them, like, you, so you can only not remove them if there is a current active connection to that network. So if there's a container that is running, that's utilizing that network, then you cannot delete that network. But if the container is stopped, you can in fact delete that network. Um, yeah, you can delete that network if the container is stopped. Uh, we'll see that a little bit later on as we go through. All right, next slide here. So let's talk about some of the different network modes. So we saw in there that the mode that this was was a bridged network. Now, again, we're not gonna dive too deep into networking tonight uh, of like actual networking. Uh, we're really gonna focus on networking as it, it as it, uh, as it, you know, as it, as it entails for Docker. Uh, but a bridge network is the kind of the default here. It's the default network that's created by Docker uh, to allow connections between Docker networks and the host machine. Um, and these bridge networks work really cool. Um, they, they allocate those uh, internal IP addresses that we saw. Um, and this, again, it's default network mode. If I was running Linux, if this was just Linux and Linux, uh, Docker was installed inside of this Linux distribution. It's not because uh, I'm running the Windows subsystem for Linux and you did an IF config. So that you can see your ethernet addresses. Oh, actually, um, actually, I think I lied. I think it is here. Um, yeah, I do think this is it. Uh, usually it gives you a little information about ETH0 being Docker, um, but it shows uh, it shows a network interface for Docker. Docker, when you install it, installs this network interface that can be used to bridge connections here. And that is the, the default connection type. So if I do Docker network LS again, um, you know, there's there's the default ones. It's just this bridge local connection that things kind of connect to by default. And it's a bridge driver. And again, what that is going to end up doing, is going to end up uh, creating this little, uh, it's going to end up creating this little, um, you know, subnetted network uh, where the things inside of that network can kind of talk to each other over that network using those internal IP addresses. Um, and I'll show you a little infographic in a little bit about it and how that works uh, compared to some of the other things. Um, What's interesting about these um, is that 
uh, although the things inside of each bridge network can talk to each other, things in other bridge networks cannot talk to each other. So it's something in a bridge network that's over here. Let's say you have two networks. We made contained number one and we made contained number two. And we try to get something from contained number one to talk to contained number two. They would not be able to speak to each other. Uh, they were all on completely different subnets. They don't have a path to speak to each other. And let's see that real time because it's cool when you see it real time. What's up, Resno? Good to have you. The she boss. Good evening. Good to see you. Glad you came through. Glad you said hello. Glad you're in here. Um, basic question here, other than bridge network, what other kind of networks would you need? Uh, I don't know much about networking. working. Um, so I'm gonna give you three. Uh, we're gonna go through the three basic ones. Uh, there are five to six uh, different networks. I'll talk about all of them. Um, but yeah, I mean, most of it's for just normal Docker computing needs. Like if you're just using Docker, bridge is usually what you want. Um, yeah, bridge is usually what you want, but we'll talk about why you would need each one. Um, and so let's see kind of how bridge works a little bit. What we can do here is we can do a Docker, um, run dash D, um, I don't even think I need to expose any ports here. I'm going to run three different Nginx containers. I'm gonna run three different Nginx containers here. Um, Docker run Nginx. I deleted all my images, so that's gonna run one. Uh, actually, no, 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 no. I'll leave, I'll leave that one running. Uh, no, 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 I'm gonna stop that. I'm sorry. I'm gonna create two networks first. Uh, Docker stop. Eight. All right, so let's create two networks really quick. We can create a contained and I'm gonna create uh, um, a mastermind network. Uh, so Docker uh, networks, network, create a uh, mastermind. Okay, so Docker network, LS. All right, so I have a contained network and a mastermind network, both bridge networks, both great. Let's take a look at them real quick. Docker inspect, network inspect, network inspect. I cannot type network inspect. Let's take a look at contained real quick. And let's take a look at the subnet 172.30.0.0 is what it got allocated. So the addresses that are in the subnet will uh, start with this. And if we do the same thing with mastermind, I wanna, uh, you can see here it's given the ranges with dot 31. So a uh, completely different um, subnetting uh, there and yeah, we'll, we'll see that in action. So the IP addresses for each of these containers will be a little bit different. Um, and so we're gonna run two containers really quick in each of these subnets and we'll show how they can uh, talk to each other or not talk to each other. The she boss, again, always, every time, thank you so much for the gift of sub. Resno, please, please, please. The she boss is always here um, uh, being very kind, very gracious very supportive please give her a nice warm thank you for the gifted sub i do appreciate you so much um okay so now that we have two networks here this is how you connect a container you run a container and connect them to uh the network can you have two overlapping cider uh, blocks i do not think you can uh and docker will not do it out of the box by default i think if you're gonna have it i think that you would probably have to figure out a way to do it on your own but i do not think you can have two overlapping cider blocks. So the way that you would connect a, con a running container to this, you can attach a container while it's, you can attach a container to a network after it's already running. I'll show you how to do that. But all you do is Docker run dash dash network, dash dash network equals and the network name and the network name, let's put two of them really quick. Let's put them in mastermind um, and we'll do Nginx, actually let's do a dash D to keep it up, to make it run as a, you know, in the background and detached mode. Um, and so we'll run Nginx. And so this is one container that's in the mastermind network and we'll run one more. So we have Docker PS, look at this. We have two containers that are running, two of them that are running. How can we confirm a container is in a certain, uh, a certain network? Let's, let's take a look at inspect. Let's do Docker inspect. And let's grab one of the IDs. And remember, you only have to use enough numbers or letters to make it unique. And so we can just do a one. 
and check that out and let's pipe that to jq so we can get some colors here and you can see the network id that exists here and i can compare this network id c4 e85 all right so i'm gonna look at my docker uh network ls and for mastermind c4 e85 so this is the network that it's in we can confirm that it is in the network that we care about it says it's actually right here i didn't even see that uh it is in the mastermind network okay so now we have two containers that are in this mastermind network they're both running nginx so they are they have exposed ports uh that are running web servers now i'm gonna spin up two more that are in the um that are in the contained network and let's do one more um so now i have four running containers all right four running containers that are living in two different networks one network over here one network over here remember everything in the, everything in each of the networks can speak to things that are in the network but they cannot speak across networks um they can't speak across networks and so um let's see that in action so i'm going to log into this one uh actually one of these these are the ones that were in mastermind and so i'm going to uh docker exec that's itd uh what's that 303 slash bin slash bash so i'm gonna get in whoa oh i what just happened it's just spitting me out. What's going on? What's going on? Docker exec dash ITD is 303 not unique. No, 303 is unique. Um, why is it just spitting me out? Why is it just spitting it back to me like that? Docker. Oh, I just IT 303 slash bin. All right, there we go. Now I'm logged in. Um, that's when you use Docker Compose to create. Yes. Can you cover Docker Compose, please? Yes, so Docker Compose is next time. Uh, Docker Compose is... I believe it's next time, pretty sure. Um, and just running multi-container applications, it is next time. Um, we will absolutely be covering Docker Compose. Okay, so I've logged into a container really quick that is in the Mastermind subnet. And so I'm gonna do something really quick. I'm gonna install uh, Ping because... Uh, yeah, I'm gonna install an application called Ping, which allows you to uh, hit a um, hit another server over an ICMP connection and test whether or not it's up. And Ping is a really good tool to determine whether or not you can receive uh, requests to determine if a host is up. And I need, it doesn't come by default in this image, so I'm gonna install it really quick. Um, apt update, uh, I think it's in and apt install uh what is it ip utils i think ping i think this will do it so i'm just gonna get ping in here really quick uh i spelled install wrong so i'm gonna get ping really quick just so that i can go through and i can ping um these other services so here is i'm, I'm logging to this container right here this is the other one that's in the same um it's in the same subnet that i'm in it's in the same network so i'm going to go ahead and you can the docker container id is also the host name of the computer um and so you can actually reach out to other containers in the same network using this as its name as its, instead of the ip address so i'm going to take this really quick and i'm going to do ping and i'm going to paste in this ip address and right here I'm actually getting requests back. I'm getting, these are all saying, uh, hey, I, I sent out a request to this IP address and we can confirm the IP address of that server in a second. But this is the IP address that it ends up hitting, 173.31.0.3. Let's confirm that IP address really quick. We're gonna take this, we already have this. Uh, let's inspect it real quick. And uh, this is the IP address right here, 172.31.0.3. That's the IP of the address of the container that we were just uh, pinging. And so we were able to successfully ping that container. But now let's go ahead and try to ping one of these ones that's not in the same network. I'll take this and I'll log right back into that container and I will ping this. 
and it says hey name or service unknown i do not know what that is i cannot resolve this name uh i actually don't even if i put in the ip address it's gonna say hey i don't i can't reach that ip address and so again the thing that you need to know about these bridge connections uh, these bridge networks is that uh, these networks, um, they're all isolated. Each network is isolated from one another. Uh, there is a way to get those to talk, uh, but not out of the box. It is not, uh, it's not that. Can you use the container name instead of the ID? Great question. Um, yes. Uh, well, actually, I don't know. I'm thinking about Docker Compose. I don't know. Let's find out right now. Let's take distracted Samit. I don't think you can, um, but let's find out and you cannot uh you have to use uh either the host name over here uh or the ip address um yeah you can't use the, the name but when we get to docker compose when we get to other container um container orchestration tools uh you can use uh the name that's used to to identify the container you can use that name for networking all, almost all of them allow you to do that uh they, they do all the back end work for you to be able to do that successfully What's up, uh, Pones in? How you doing tonight? Okay, that's about everything you need to know about these kind of first bridge networks. Um, that one, you can create one with uh, Docker and Network Create, and you can create, so these, allow you to isolate different things so if you have different if you're trying out a bunch of different things and you want to keep them kind of isolated in their own space uh make sure that you know they're isolated you can do this i've seen you know a place you might want to do this is maybe you have a single server where all your developers need to do their thing um and you might want to uh you might want to uh, segregate each of their networks uh, like this using these networks so that their tools and things uh can only be accessed inside of their little bubble inside of their little network. Uh, so yeah, so this is just, and then so from here, this will allow you now to do that port mapping because it's a bridge network, it's bridged to your host system. So now you can do some port mapping out to your host system, just like we've done before. Remember, this is the, the default way that networks work in Docker. All right, so talk about bridge networking. What are some other ones? Another network type is actually none none is a network type and so we can specify the network type of none this provides no networking outside of the container a truly isolated container and why would you want something like this uh you would want something like this if you're you know uh the it may maybe the app the data that you're working with is sensitive it, you know it has to be that you can do the work that you need uh, internally that container. Maybe it's just processing a job on the computer uh, and you don't need it to, to send any data anywhere. It's not pulling down any data. It's not sending data anywhere. Uh, yeah, there, you, you just need a job to run inside of a container. Um, you need a container to do some type of local processing. Uh, you can specify a network type of none. And again, this will, this just allows no outside networking and again, um, you know, I could also run another, um, Nginx thing. Um, so watch this. Let's try to do, actually, let's, let's see what happens if I do this. I'm gonna specify none, but I'm actually going to try to do a port map here. Um, and I'm going to try to do port 80 to 80. And so it does that. And I, I, I have expected that to, to not work at all. But if I go to locals, this would normally work. This would normally work. I selected network type none, and this would normally work. But right now, it is not working. Error connection refuse doesn't work. If I do this again with removing the network none, and so that it uses a bridge network by default, now if I head over here, it works. It works just fine so a uh, bridge network allows you again to have some connection to the host machine the uh, network type of none truly isolates that container no matter what you do all the port you can do all the port mapping you want in the world you simply specify a none networking type and it is this is now an isolated container that is inaccessible uh through any network so uh let's see what that looks like uh let's if we inspect this Let's see what that looks like. Um, it's probably this one that was about a minute ago.
and networks none. And so you can start to see that it has no IP address, no gateway. Uh, it does have a network ID. This none network is a network that is listed in that networks list. Um, but yeah, you don't get any IP addresses for this. So that's how it works. It is, it's good for isolating applications. If you don't need it to grab any data down or send any data anywhere, this might be a good option for you to keep yourself as safe as possible. So that is the network type of none. Any questions so far about either one of those things? Bridge networks that we already touched or the network type of none. We're about to hit the last kind of main one and then we'll talk about the other two or three. I think there's only two more, um, but we're only gonna go like go hands on with one more. Get a little uh, maple pecans glazed mix. Mm, very high society. All right, sorry. I need a little, need a little sugar. She boss coming in hot again. B Green Go Thirty One. Congratulations. Congratulations on your gifted sub from the most given person on the planet. It seems. Thank you, She boss, for all of your love and hard work. The gift you've given ten gifted subs. Amazing. Truly, truly amazing. All right. Again, that's the that was the you know. That was the pay gate again to get to the next slide. So let's move on to the next network. And this is the infamous host network. And so this one's very interesting. Um, I didn't know about the host network for a really long time actually. And when I found out about it, I was like, man, this like this is great. It's, it's not that great, but like also it's kind of great. Uh, if you just don't want to run an application normally and you just like running things in containers, this is a kind of, you know, a, this makes it like it's a normal thing. Um, but let's talk about that. One of these videos going on YouTube channel uh, tonight. Uh, all of the past ones are going to, I've, I've rendered out every video so far. This one will not go up tonight because I have to render this one out, uh, but it takes, so here's here. Well, here's what I, I, I'm trying to get into a place where I render them out immediately afterwards and I take them into the office the next day because my office has upload speeds of like 100 megs and here I have upload speeds of like 28 or something and so it takes forever because these are all like these are all like 8 gig 9 gig videos um, but the rest will go up tonight because I, I did render them out today actually um, and this one hopefully will go up tomorrow um, or I'll put them all up in the morning when I can just upload them from the office uh, so definitely before Saturday. How about that? Um, before Saturday. But like I said, they should all still be within the two week window. So I think you can still watch all of them on here so far. But the host network, the container is networked uh, as if it was part like a part of the host machine, as if it was simply a process or application that is running on the host machine. No port mapping required. So if I run something that is exposed on port 80 it will consume port 80 and be done i do not have to i don't even have to map it i don't have to map it at all um it'll just kind of work uh but now that port 80 is consumed i cannot run another container on port 80 so you lose uh you lose some of the cool things about containers but if you just want to run an application uh like you normally would but you would like to run it through a container host networks may be the way to go and we're gonna see that in action right meow I have to watch the full video a little later because I'm in the middle of physics exam. Ooh, physics exam. I'm, you know, I like physics, but uh, sounds tough. I don't want to take any physics exams, uh, but dope, dope. Thanks for coming through. Thank you so much for, uh, again, all of your love, all of your uh, your generosity. I do, I do appreciate it. Um, so let's see here. Let's see the host network and let's stop all of our containers that we have so far. Uh, Docker, our uh, Docker stop, dollar sign, Docker PS dash A, dash Q. Excuse me. So, the reason uh, I didn't talk about this before, um, the reason you have to pass in, you, like, you should, I'll paste this in for anyone who wants to. Like this is something good to just have handy, like, when you're doing a bunch of stuff, because it's really annoying to delete 
every Docker container uh, manually. But you need the queue there uh, because you need to um, Docker stop only takes in these IDs. And so you need the queue there because that gives the IDs only. But if you want to remove them all, you still got to add the A because you need to get the IDs of the other ones. Okay, so I have no more containers um, at all. So now we can um, do a host network one. And so we can simply run our Nginx one again. Also, what's up, uh, Deyua? Welcome to the channel, good to have you. Uh, Nathaniel for life. Welcome to the channel. Uh, Nemo Winks. Welcome to the channel. Good to have you. Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone. All right. So what we're going to do here is we're going to give this a host network network of host. All right. And so I'm going to remove this port mapping. Actually, I'm going to remove it. The Nginx container. Um, maybe it maybe you don't know, but the Nginx container uh, in the Docker file, the way that it works, it has port 80 exposed already. Um, so if I hit this and I run it, I'm not running any other container, but if we go ahead and we just refresh this page, it should still work, but it does not still work. What's happening here? It does not work. Uh, what happened here? Uh, Docker network. Should be a host network and Maybe I do have to so expose. I thought, uh, is it running? It is running. Uh, let me, I shouldn't have to port map it. I should not have to port map it. Uh, Docker host network port. Human container does not have its own IP address when the host mode port mapping does not take effect and the dash P option ignored producing instead. Yeah, published ports are described. That's true. Does not have its own IP address. Oh, 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 oh. Is this because I cannot use localhost when using this? It works out isolated from Docker, shares networking namespace. Right now, port 80, use host network. Locations available on port 80 on the host IP address. Um, so let me see something here. Uh, I should be able to do localhost, uh, here. It's interesting that I can't, I would probably have to use my actual computer's, uh, address. I don't really know what's, I don't really know why I can't get to it. Um, I've always been able to get to it through, I thought I was able to get through the locals, but I never use it. Um, but essentially all the host um, networking uh, network does is again, it, it operates, a, it basically runs a container um, through your host machines network. And so uh, as long as the application is configured to expose uh, specific ports, um, that then when you actually run it, uh, it should be accessible through your host machine's IP address. Localhost should work. Um, this might be, this might be a um, a WSL two thing. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Let me know if it's working for you or not. If you're trying to follow along with this, um, I feel like it is, because um, we should be able to access through localhost. But that's all it simply is. So what that does mean though is before you saw me run like five or six different nginx containers at once that would mean you could no longer if you do the host network and once port 80 is consumed you cannot run another container uh that is expected to go over that port so you lose the ability to run multiple uh containers of the same type um so just you know again it's really just a way for you to run processes kind of normally um but they're just running in containers instead of actually running directly on the machine that's kind of all you need to know about that. You probably will never d change while you're doing normal Docker stuff. You probably will never change your uh, network type. You probably will have no need to change your network type. Um, you can kind of just leave it kind of the way it is. Uh, and it usually works pretty well. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that is the host container type. So a uh, host network type. So the three 
network types let's cover this part again just bridge this is kind of the default network type this bridges the container network uh it to your host machine and it allows for some connections to happen there this is what allows for port mapping um this is the one that comes by default um and you know you can create as many of these as you want uh these bridge networks um they everything that's in that network can talk to each other but things cannot talk across those bridge networks by default what's up my primo uh with the with the coding garden uh, uh emoji i love it must have a lot of devices using class b hey i mean hey i have a lot of devices period first off real quick just because you said the word devices everything that was wrong with my computer was my fault minus the graphics problem that blue screened me um it was my fault i had i had a bunch of high bandwidth things plugged into my usb 2.0 ports i don't know why i did that like i was like fixing some stuff and i like broke all i, I plugged things into the wrong place i have a lot of stuff plugged into my computer like way too much uh and as soon as i fixed everything and moved everything to the right places uh my computer started working phenomenally fine so uh, that's my fault but bridge networks uh Everything in the network can talk to each other. They cannot talk across networks by default. Uh, the none network, uh, truly isolated container, no outside networking. You can use this for you know anything that doesn't need the internet. Um, and the host network, which consumes the, the container, basically runs through and consumes the host network. Um, and so the downside of that is, you know, uh, one, you don't have to do any port mapping, but uh, that also means you can only run one container that is exposed on a certain port um, at a time. So be wary of that. So those are the three things you need to know about networks. There are two other network types that we can just run over real quick. One is, um, one is overlay networks and overlay networks are the thing that allows those um those bridge networks those individual bridge networks to do some communications and this is generally used for orchestration tools it's actually created for docker swarm which is an orchestration tool kind of like kubernetes um and so there is an overlay network that you can create to allow these different uh, bridge networks to be able to, to speak to each other. Uh, there's also another one called, um, I think it's called Mac, um, Mac LVN or something, uh, Docker Networks. I think it allows you to give, um, I think it allows you to give, yeah, Mac VLAN. I don't, I don't, I don't know why I said that, Mac LVN. Uh, Mac VLAN, um, you, can, you can assign MAC addresses to the container uh, so that it appears as a physical device on your network. Uh, this is pretty interesting. I've never found the need to use this yet, um, but it seems really cool. Um, I, I, can, I, can see, I can see that being useful in a number of ways. But yeah, it's a, it's a way that you can do that. I wouldn't stress about diving into either one of these, but yeah, these are just kind of the two that are here. Is it possible to have a single Docker connected to two different networks? For example, having a host network uh, plus a virtual network. I don't, you know what's funny about that? I don't know. I actually don't know. Uh, let's let's actually just try to run a Docker container real quick. I, I don't know that. Um, never even thought about it, to be honest. I, I doubt it, but let's find out. Um, let's Docker run dash D. Uh, dash dash network. I, I bet if it does take two network commands, the second one will override it. Um, but let's see. Uh, let's give it mastermind. Let's give it dash dash network equals contained. Uh, and let's give it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Two net, it can't have two network endpoints. So I, I, I was I really doubt it. Um, but never even thought about it. Host networking driver only supports Linux hosts. It does not support Docker for Mac. Yeah. Okay. Yes. All right. That makes sense. That makes perfect sense, actually. Cause I was like, mm, I'm pretty sure this works just fine. Every other time I've done it. Um, all good. That makes sense though. Um, I'm never going to use host networking. So we're not never, but I highly doubt I'm going to use it. Okay. Is there a free site uh, to test and learn Docker? Um, I don't know. I'm sure there is. Uh, let's see, um, run Docker containers free. Um, Docker curriculum. What is this? First off, I think they stole my, uh, it's not mine, but uh, this feels like a Hugo site. 
Um, this feels like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you can run it here, but there's a lot of places to get Docker information for sure. Like uh, there's no, there's definitely no shortage of Docker learning information. Um, I'll send you this right here. I, I don't know if it's good or not. Um, I originally learned Docker through Linux Academy a long time ago, but I learned it like a long time ago. Uh, and ever since then, I've been like learning things from whatever articles and things that I find. But yes, so we learned that you cannot connect to two containers at once. All right, let's move on to the next piece here. Uh, what's up, uh, Don Feed 69 Welcome to the channel. Good to have you. Thank you so much for the follow. We are moving on from the networking concepts to CMD versus entry points. And this is a, this is a, always a, a, a touch point um, when people are trying to learn Docker. It's always a bit confusing. Um, I think people really feel like they have to really get this right that you don't. Um, they're both tools that allow you to do what you need to do. Um, uh, and they do this, they kind of do the same thing, but we're gonna talk about that a little bit right now. So we learned that one of the commands, one of the, the options you have, the instructions you have to put in a Docker file is the CMD command. Um, and what I told you last time is that it sets the container runtime defaults. Um, and so it's there to set some defaults. Uh, but we also learned that uh, that also meant you could use it to set what process runs when the container starts. Containers, we learned are designed to run a single process and that command can be used to, uh, to, to select what runs. Now, what we didn't talk about that much is in a Docker run command, you can actually submit this command yourself. So yes, we put this CMD in a Docker file. Yes, you can put it there, but you can override that by putting in a command during the Docker run command. So we've been doing that uh, all the time, even with the exact command, this works as well. Uh, but Docker run image name and then the command afterwards. So when we're putting that bin bash in there, um, that is us running a, a command override. If we were to do Docker run nginx bin bash, this command would overtake any commands that were in the Docker file, it would override any command that was in the Docker file. There could only be one command in the Docker file. There, well, there can actually be multiple commands, but the only the last one will uh, actually take effect. And so we'll, I'll show you what that means. I think it makes a little more sense for us to dive into it here first. Uh, you, the way that you declare a command is like this, basically command and give it a, you know, an executable or an argument uh, or just an argument. And now, um, like I said, a command in the Docker run command will override the default in the Docker file. So let's take a look at that really quick. Uh, we did one last time and let's see if we can find that. Um, I don't know where we were. We were in contained and I think we were right here. Uh, yeah, so this is the, um, well, this is the one that we overwrote this with um, after we wrote that little shell script. Um, this is actually very interesting. This is very, very interesting. Um, I think there's a better command. There's a better command for this because this is hard to see. Um, but you know what, actually, before, let's talk about entry point real quick and then it'll make it easier for us to just run through some tests with this um, to show you uh, what what the difference is. So that's the command. Uh, the X, so entry point uh, does the same thing, but entry point uh, sets the, the containers executability, it, it sets an executable, uh, but it's very similar to this, the CMD command. You do not need an entry point command. You can, you can get by with a CMD command. Um, but if you are to use both, if you do use both, if you use an entry point command, that sets the executable. So that sets the command that's going to like the, the thing that's going to execute when the container starts. And if you have that in there, the CMD now becomes a command line argument to the entry point. So what does that mean? This is the command line right here. This is the command line. And let's say our container, our, our, our uh, Docker file had an entry point of, uh, it was gonna run, um, it was gonna run a free command. It was gonna just run free, which gives you back memory, gives you back information about memory on your computer, it runs free. 
that will be the entry point the entry point would be free it would be that command free but you could use the cmd to set some defaults uh and i can set a default in the command of dash h to make it human readable and so if i set an entry point of free and a command of dash h it would it would put those two things together um the entry point runs the executable um and everything after the entry point everything in the command will get appended to that entry point command so um it's very interesting we'll do some stuff real time in a second so you can see it was super confusing to me the first time i learned about it um i didn't really understand the concept of it or why it mattered one of the biggest reasons why it's great is it enables uh entry point scripts so containers uh i have for them to work well container images need to have a high level of configurability and if you have a high level of configurability uh then that means you have to do a high level of configuration when an application starts for uh longer running things uh especially for things that persist data there's a lot of stuff that needs to happen to make them work properly entry point scripts are the way to handle all of that we're going to look at one in a, in a few with uh for my sequel um and and show you how you can utilize entry points with cmds with commands to make the things happen that you want to make happen now like i said don't sweat it if you don't fully grasp this concept as we're going through it um i find that people really struggle with this one i feel like i struggled with this one in the beginning but uh yeah let's go through it well essentially the example that we have in here in this docker file this has it's going to use the Ubuntu image. This is what it's going to run when the container starts. Now, you may say, hey, why is it like that? Why is it in uh, brackets? Why are there quotes? What you have to do is you are splitting up. You have to split up the arguments um, by commas and quotes. So top dash B. So this command is actually really this right here. So this entry point command will simply run this. And this is top dash B. Um, this is what top dash B looks like. But it also has this dash C as a default. And so what, what happens is it actually ends up not running this. It actually runs the entry point, but it also continues to run uh, whatever else is on the command line uh, with the CMD. So it adds in the dash C. So when you see both of these things, if no command is passed in during the run, this is this is actually the command it'll run with it actually run with this instead um and the dash c just adds in a different uh paradigm for top um i want to say dash c adds uh i want to say it 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 filters by does some something with the cpu let's see real quick um i'm not 100 percent sure what dash c does command line name I'm not command line. Um, all right, that's the command line program name toggle starts top with a last remembered C state reverse. Thus, top was displaying command lines, show the field of program names. So yeah, so it just passes in this as another option. I'm gonna remove the B in a second, but um, let's make it a little bit uh, a little bit simpler with commands that are more easily seeable. Um, And so maybe our entry point is LS and maybe the first argument is dash L. So um, I'm not gonna run this yet, um, but an LS does this. It, it lists out the files and directories that are in the current directory. And an LS dash L does a long listing. And so it does, you know, it's, it's, it's got this stuff right here. Let's actually go to this file. Uh, let's go somewhere, hold on. Let's, Let's go somewhere we're gonna have all right here. So ls-l looks like this. It prints out everything in a long list format, um, which is great, right? As is uh, very exciting. Um, but let's, uh, we should move that Docker file here, but. Let's vim contained Docker file. 
but um we could add in a c uh um, we can add in a command of dash a so dash a in the ls command will append um will show all files so not just regular files but also hidden files as well and uh so that will be like me running this ls dash l a and it shows these dot files that are right here and so what i'm gonna do is i am going to um i'm gonna move in here really quick and i'm gonna make a directory real real fast um uh, i'm gonna make a i'm gonna build it real quick docker build dash t um let's just call it ls test uh, right here how about rm uh, oh no how about i don't rm dash rf how about that huh i got you there see you thought you, you thought you were gonna trick me you thought you got me you were gonna come in and troll and i untrolled you but nah i absolutely not you know i don't want i don't want to delete anything uh all right so i'm gonna run that uh docker run uh ls test and uh, whoa that was dumb that was actually very stupid of me uh but it did work it did it did work i don't even know why i thought it was gonna do something different uh but what it did is it did an ls and it's showing me a hidden file it's showing me a hidden file here so it did an ls dash la in the container itself if i were to um Uh, if I were to remove that, um, actually, um, I can override that. So um, some other things you can do is uh, let's do ls dash ld. Um, I don't think I don't think ld shows. Um, I should, uh, hold on, man, LS. Let me get something that does something fun. Um, here, these directory list, this directories themselves, not their contents. Now let's do a um, dash dash F file type. Ooh, dash G, do not list owner. Okay, so if I were to run that command that we just ran again, uh, so let's let's actually do the run LS test does this and it prints out everything that's in here with the user and the group It looks like if I pass in the dash G. This is me passing in a command on the run This will override the dash a that we put in the other file and the docker file What that means is without the dash a running the next time we run this this should not show up and it should show all of these with just the user or without the user just the group so it should only be one column of this and in fact we do not see the dot file and we only see one column of root i've now overridden the the defaults of the container um and so it ran the entry point and then it appended whatever i added in as the command and i added on the command at the end of the run here rather than in the docker file and so uh that's kind of the relationship here uh, i think i think they always do it with like the example that they always show it with is like um they do it with like an ubuntu container and do it with like sleep and then pass in the seconds if you want to pass in the seconds but yeah something like cmd bash dash c mean um so bash c would uh basically be executing a bash um shell um i don't know what the c for bash is man uh i i shouldn't know what it is but i do not know if c option is present the commands are read from the first non-option argument command um if there are arguments after the command string the first argument is assigned to zero and if any remaining okay so um yes this would simply uh execute your bash shell and so shells the reason why uh so i think like ubuntu i think the ubuntu docker file let's go to hub.docker.com or any of the I, I think normally any of the like repo uh centric docker files um 
all end with something like that um are all executing a shell um and you can see it has been bash here very similar to bash c this just executes a shell the problem is you might say hey well when i run that how come it doesn't stay up how come it doesn't drop me into a shell uh that's because a shell by default is actually waiting for uh, uh it's actually waiting for a tty device it's waiting for your keyboard and some input and when you just run it it's not receiving those things properly and so it says hey i ran my shell i i started up i executed i didn't get anything so i'm i did my job and i'm done and i go out and die now uh but yes this is like the same thing as this for the most part this would be the same thing as slash bin slash bash dash c um just the execution of a shell itself. And so this is just Linux command. So if you ever wanted to know what that was and you just type in bash dash C, and say, this requires an argument and that takes in command line arguments. Like go ahead and execute this shell uh, against these commands that are being passed in. So it would be something like that. So it needs some afterwards things. So if you see bash C, it's going to need a cm it's going to need uh well a cmd with bash c seems weird to me it seems like the entry point would need to be bash c with uh with a cmd as the options but uh, yeah all right pko that's you root makes your computer run faster uh, everyone don't uh nobody d don't randomly enter in any of the commands that anyone puts in the chat unless i tell you to do it uh don't 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 just don't do it i mean just for your own advice, for your own computing uh, safety in the future. Just, you know, just be smart, okay? <laughs> All right. I've seen people get mad and like delete those comments because they're like, someone's gonna do this. I'm not here to protect you. Uh, if you gotta learn the lesson the hard way, feel free to learn the lesson the hard way. Uh, I think we've all done it, uh, but uh, you know, just don't do your best not to copy and paste random things. Uh, I mean, hey, if it's if it's a VM, I say if, if you have a VM that you don't really care about, you maybe have a backup of it. I say try them all out. I, I like I think it's actually good for you to know what happens when some of these things are run. Luckily, um, a lot of distros have put some cool safeguards in place for some of the major, uh, the crazy detrimental commands. But yeah, I would Google it first to make sure you're good to go. All right, now after that one, where are we at now? We're making great progress. And like I said, I don't think I'm gonna take up all your time tonight, uh, but that's the difference here. Um, entry point is uh, they're both used to set defaults. You do not need an entry point. Uh, you just need an ex uh, a CMD, uh, but entry point allows you to set the executable and the CMD uh, then becomes a section for the defaults. Now, let me show you this. Um, let me show you how, uh, let's talk about these scripts really quick, these entry point scripts. Let me go to hub.docker.com and let's check out my SQL real quick. Oh yes, this GIF is phenomenal. Uh, when I found out, I was like, this is the best. It made me so happy. Uh, but yeah, you know, that's kind of what it is. You know, I'm here, I'm, you know, that's that's the, the entry point is like, hey, I just walk through the door. So MySQL for anyone who doesn't know is a relational database uh, service, relational database uh, management system. Um, and let's look at the Docker file for this. And the Docker file for this has a bunch of stuff in it, but look down here there is an entry point here there's an entry point and the entry point is actually a script it says docker dash entry point dot sh it's a common paradigm just call it that you can call the script whatever you want to call it it's not a big deal at all uh but they're actually running a script as the executable so when the container starts this is the entry point it will run this script now this script here uh, but actually, so it's going to run the script, but look at the last line here. The last line for the CMD, the default is MySQL D. So MySQL D is the executable name for MySQL to start up the MySQL service. And so I said that the CMD gets appended onto the entry point. So essentially what this looks like, uh, at, like actually in a, in a shell, what it would look like is this Docker dash entry point dot sh so it would run that and this is kind of what it looks like it actually puts it together like this it, it actually puts it together like this but here's what's actually happening i'm gonna go back one and we're gonna look at this entry point script and this entry point script is doing a lot 
um but this is a common thing it's just a it's a it's a shell script that's gonna set up a lot of things for us this is commonly done again with especially with applications that persist data uh that need to get some things set up beforehand uh a bunch of stuff goes through here and happens and it's great really nice you know runs through does all the things that it needs to do but ignore all the stuff that's in here because there's a lot in here but at the very end the very end you have this you have this and this will be at the end of any really entry point script it'll be an exec uh at dollar sign at and what this what this line does is it says all right after you're done executing me after you're done like it's it's running the entry point script it says hey go ahead and execute the remaining command line arguments that are added on to here so uh this is going to take it it's going to go ahead and execute all the other commands that are on the command line um and so remember this gets added here as a command line option so the script kind of finishes and as it finishes it runs this mysql d command here so if, if you actually look through this thing uh it's actually setting my sql up and it's actually starting my sql and then it's shutting it back down and then it's starting it again with the command but that is kind of how they how they work uh you do a bunch of configuration and then you tell it to run the remainder of the command line options and uh this is a pretty common paradigm with uh dockers and cont with containers themselves uh there's definitely an art to understanding how to do it properly um and how to do it effectively but uh you know no just understand that there are these entry point containers i mean scripts uh that people use and that you can use them to do uh you know some advanced configuration and to get things set up um for your container to run properly um yeah just be familiar with it but remember that entry points the executable cmd is going to end up being the default so this was windows docker we would be uh talking batch scripts and would be exact dollars uh percent one i guess so i don't know that much about powershell or windows um but that sounds right batch script sounds uh sounds correct um and exec percent one also seems right so yes probably what's up uh riulan welcome to the channel good to have you um i think i've already got everyone else on there okay now 817 uh I'll take a sip of water now we can head over to multi-stage docker files and have uh, a slight bit of fun but once again um for the last piece again i do want to be clear cmd is uh, a lot of the time it's all you really need in the beginning <laughs> When you're doing all the, all, like, as you're learning, uh, I would stick with CMD because again, they can get a little, uh, get a little weird. Um, but yeah, they do, they do, do achieve uh, a little bit of the same thing, but uh, they, they have more power together. Linux Dockers, we do bash and Windows, we do typical Windows bash files. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay um all right let's head over to multi-stage docker files and i can get you out of here a little bit early today i think so we talked about these a little bit last time and i told you i didn't fully understand why like i understand what they are but i didn't fully understand why um and that was my fault in that i think i do understand fully understand why i just thought that the the why would be bigger than what it is um, but as far as the, the more and more research I keep doing it, the why is exactly what you all said. I just thought it would be some grander thing. Um, but, uh, I, I don't know why I put MSBD here just to save a little bit of space, but multi-stage Docker builds allow you to extract artifacts from Docker image builds, um, leaving behind all the extra junk that you don't need. And that's, uh, that's essentially at, at the heart of what they are and, and why they are. Uh, that's essentially at the heart of it uh there are some other uh there's some other attributes in here again there's uh there's some security uh benefits to this as well but this is really the main reason why they're around and why they implemented it is a relatively new thing as well uh, i i want to say it wasn't until docker 17 or so i think we're on docker 19 right now um i think i have the latest version of docker because i just installed it uh wsl2 on here uh docker version 
uh what do we, we are 1903 and docker 17 which is you know i've been using docker since like docker 7 or something like that so it's been a little while um and yeah i mean it, it it's relatively new um so remember when i told you docker files would only have a single from command well i lied to you and i lied to you on purpose um again uh, i think this concept is still pretty important um that that they used to only contain one from command until docker 17 but um you know i lied to you each new from command is what initiates the new stage of the build and so uh you you do from you do your docker file stuff um you know you have all your build information in there and then you initiate another from command and what that does is that starts a whole new process uh kind of uh, ignoring the the things that have been built before this uh but you can retain some of that information you can uh, pull out some of that information and we are going to do a little bit of that right now uh this is commonly the examples of this are almost all like almost every example you look up on this will be done with go so we are going to do it with go because i do love go and and docker is written in go uh but yeah and you can name each stage uh using the as keyword uh, in the from command and we'll see what that looks like right now we will do some of this so what do we mean when we have say multiple stages w exactly what it sounds like uh, it means that uh, we have different parts of the build that are designed for different reasons that build a different uh, piece of the application. Commonly, what the like the, the the basic paradigm of this is you'll have a container that builds. Uh, you'll have an image build that builds the uh, the executable. So, um, especially I think Go is always is, is usually used for this because uh, compiled languages such as Go or Java they compile down to a target uh target executable that can be run um just kind of as is everything is kind of contained in the executable um and so uh we can have a docker file that builds to that executable and then we can just take that executable and put it in another container to run so that we don't have all the extra stuff that we needed to build the executable we don't need any of that stuff anymore we just need to be able to run it and so we can put it into another container that is uh, smaller to be able to run what again what this does is it gets rid of all the crap uh, and it makes the container much smaller and this is why people uh rant and rave about it um and it makes sense it does make sense and so let's take a look at our images right now Docker images, and we have a couple of different things here, and there are various sizes, 73.9, 132, 73.9 megabytes. So uh, not tiny, but also not, you know, all, not all that big. Now, the smallest, um, the smallest container that you can uh, get is if you do from scratch, but the smallest runnable container that has executables that you need to be able to run things in Linux is the Alpine container. And so commonly, um, things will be built with an Alpine base image because it is very small. It is only five megabytes in size. Uh, very, very tiny, really nice. So we're gonna go ahead and pull this Alpine container really quick because we just, you know, we want to have it because it's really tiny. And if we look at it, 5.57 megabytes, real, real tiny, many magnitudes of size smaller than these here. Okay. Oh yeah, uh, uh, Alpine, what's the Alpine Buster? What is it like this? Um, I don't know what the tag is, or is it Alpine? That's, that's the tag. Nope, I don't, I, I don't know how to get it. Um, I'll look it up in a second. My nose just started. I'm sorry. That was weird. My nose just started like, you know, when you uh, like, like go into a pool and like water goes up your nose and then it, like burns a little bit. Oh, really weird. That was an odd thing. Ah, yes, Mr. Smoofy. I too did have a phenomenal Alpine system in my uh, car. My very first car, and I know that I'm giving you all a uh, a security question that you can use to to uh, steal from me. But my very first car was a year 2000 GMC Jimmy Green. It was green. It was a green GMC Jimmy. It looks just like this, but 
better. It looks like, yeah, there we go. The good old Jimmy. A lot of great memories from having that car. The door was falling off. I had to roll down the window. I had to roll down the window a little bit to lift up. Like I had to, like the door was like dropping off the hinge. So when you opened it, it would drop a little bit. So for you to close it, you have to close it really hard, like really hard. So it would have enough momentum to like pop back up or you'd have to open up the, roll down the window a little bit, lift it up and close it. And because I closed it hard so many times, the internal thing like popped off and like, it was great though. That thing got me through everything. My my dad, like uh, the school that I went to, um, the high school that I went to, um, there are no buses. So my dad was like, he's like, I'm not, I'm tired of taking you to school every morning. Like I'm gonna set this car to the side. Like he set it aside, like, three years before I could drive. It was broken. It was broken. He was like, I'm not getting it fixed. I'm going to get a, a nice car. He went and got himself a Mercedes and he sat this broken car in the driveway for years. And I was like, hey, I want that bad boy. I don't care I, that I see freedom right now. And he gave me, he gave it to me broken gas gauge and a broken gas gauge when gas was like four something a gallon, like gas was very expensive. And so, you know, I didn't have a job <laughs> I was struggling. It was, I ran a gas maybe five or six times. Uh, but man, that car was, I loved it. I loved it. The transmission went and we got rid of it just cause it just, it was already not worth anything. And so, it was a it was a year two thousand car. I got it in two thousand and six or seven with like a hundred and like eighty thousand miles on it. And uh, yeah, you know, good times, good times. Just giving you a little bit about my life, uh, the GMC Jimmy. But I had an Alpine head unit. In it. I put it in myself. I put it in myself so that I could wire up some subs. I had two 15 inch uh, Alpine subs in the car. I had kickers first. I had Sony subs first. Got rid of the Sonys put in some kickers, got rid of the kickers and got Alpine type R subs. I think I had type L's first, but I had Alpine type R's with all blown regular speakers. And I could not hear, I could only hear bass, nothing but bass, nothing, nothing but bass. And that is what I had. And it was amazing. It was like the best and I couldn't hear my music. And I was fine with that. I just wanted the bass. That's all you need. So it was exciting. All right. <laughs> Getting away from Alpine, getting away from the Jimmy. Uh, all right, so let's hop back in here. So Alpine, the, the smallest image you can get to actually execute, um, a, like actually execute a Linux command. So um, let's say we are developing a uh, a Go a Go application, and so I'm gonna actually pull the GoLang container, and I'm pretty sure it's Docker pull GoLang. I'll confirm if that doesn't work. Cool. Uh, you can already see there's a lot of layers coming in and they're not tiny layers. And you're like, okay, all right, that's, 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 that's gonna be a lot. But let's see, I'm gonna pull Golang. Golang does have an Alpine image, but I wanna, I wanna show you, I'm gonna prove a point to you first. Um, all right, Docker images, we grabbed Golang. Look at this, 810 megabytes. That's wild, 810 megabytes for the Golang container. And so that, you know, we're developing a Go app. We need the Golang container, right? Makes sense. Uh, I'm also gonna pull the Golang, uh, the Golang Alpine. No, I'm gonna leave it at Golang for now. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna write a quick Docker file real quick. Actually, we need to write, we need to write a, uh, an application first. Um, let's uh, make their Go fun. Uh, and let's go fun. Um, I could just use like a hello world, but let's make it a little more fun. Let's write a quick, uh, let's write, let's write Fizzbuzz real quick. You know, we're keeping it simple. We did hello world. Let's do Fizzbuzz real quick. Let's write a quick go Fizzbuzz. Um, what happened here? Um, so Fizzbuzz, let's do a loop uh, for I, if anyone's not familiar with Go, again, it's just a programming language uh, written by Google. Uh, people love to use it because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's very fast, very performant, uh, and it's pretty simple to write. I think it's pretty simple to write. Uh, a lot of people think it's pretty simple to write in comparison to a lot of the other, um, systems languages. Um, so for I equals zero, while I is less than or equal to one hundo, uh, I plus plus, uh, we need to format dot 
print line let's just print out one one hundred let's just you know I, 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 I my go might be a little bit rusty so let's just print out i real quick let's just make sure we have our syntax right before i write a bunch of code let's see if we can run this application that counts to 100 real quick go run fizzbuzz.go and whoa that's not what i wanted um i is less than format dot print line. oh yeah it is that is what i wanted i think I think it was just all on one line because yes, this is what I wanted. It was just printing on the same line. This is what I wanted. So I wrote a quick application really quick that prints to 100. If people don't know what FizzBuzz is, FizzBuzz is a uh, just a simple algorithm problem uh, where the goal is to print out the numbers one to one, zero to 100 or one to 100. Uh, for every number that is evenly divisible by three, you print out the word Fizz. For every number that is evenly divisible by the number five, you print out Buzz. And everything that's divisible by three and five, you print out FizzBuzz. And we've done this a million times. Um, and so I'm just gonna write a quick, I'm just gonna write it real quick. Um, uh, so if uh, I mod 15 uh, equals equals zero, um, I'll go ahead and format the print line. Uh, I think was this FizzBuzz? FizzBuzz. So anything divisible by three and five is FizzBuzz. Um, that looks good, I think else if it feels right um i mod five equals zero go ahead and print out format dot print line uh, i think five we want buzz i think and for the other one i'll say if i Where's mod? Mod three equals zero. Let's go ahead and format dot print line. Fizz. All right. And we need a, we need an else here. Um, and we need actually need this as the else. And close it and i actually think this is the I, I think this should be it um and let's test let's run it and test it and so what it does is it just prints out uh one to 100 okay his bus first but press out the number one two three is evenly divisible by three so it prints out fizz five is evenly divisible by five so it prints buzz and six is evenly divisible by three so it prints buzz and the first number that's evenly divisible by both is 15 so 15 is evenly divisible by three and five so it should be 15, 30, 60, uh, 45, 60, 90. Cool. All right, whatever. Whether or not it, it is right, even if it wasn't right, we don't really care right now. But this is a cool, we just, we wrote our own little Go application that we can use now to be able to build into um, an application real quick. So let's take this FizzBuzz uh, application. We say, hey, we wrote, this really, we wrote this really cool application. We need to containerize it so we can deliver it to people. And so we're gonna vim a Docker file real quick um docker file we're gonna film this docker file and let's say from golang and we'll say golang latest or just golang remember if you don't put the tag it automatically refers to latest every single time so i'm gonna go ahead and i'm gonna put latest here just to be explicit um uh, because sometimes you like to be explicit and um for golang uh, the work there is usually I, mean, I don't actually need to put this we'll make a work there. We'll make the work there uh, fizzbuzz um, Just so that's where it does everything and then we're gonna copy in our application So all we're gonna do is copy in our go file to this location So um, I could give it the actual name. It's just gonna copy everything from this directory in um, For one thing and then we're gonna need to build the executable now. Um, I never remember um, I never remember go build uh, Linux. I never remember um, what you can do. Um, I think it's something. I never remember the actual commands for the actual building to the target. Uh, but I think I could just do run. Uh, let's actually test it really quick from the command line. Um, CD. Let 
make this a little bit larger all right, i think i can do go uh build uh build and i can give it a verbose um i actually don't even think i need to give it a target i think it'll 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 if i'm building on linux i think it'll build against my own target uh, i can give it an output file like uh like like uh like compiled fizz um let's see if that works okay and all right cool yes that's all you gotta do all right so i don't need any i don't need a crazy uh command just a dash v and a dash o okay let's remove this real quick uh and let's wait where'd our docker file go oh it's over here we're not done with it okay dot run uh go build um go build dash v dash o i don't even think i need a dash v and the output file i'm just gonna make it i'm gonna simply make it fizzbuzz as well fizzbuzz uh so that's gonna be the executable that gets created when i'm done with this uh, and then a normal docker file would look like this i'd add in a cmd right here and i'd say go ahead and simply just run execute this fizzbuzz executable that gets created so this build file is going to create a file called fizzbuzz that's an ex that you can actually execute and this is the command how you execute it in linux and it will execute that executable so let's see if this builds what we want it to build and i'm going to say go and i'm going to say docker build dash uh t um and i'm gonna give it a name and i'm gonna call this um fizz buzz um fizz buzz i'm just gonna call this one fizz buzz normal uh because we're gonna do a couple different versions of this really quick so that you can see what a multi-stage build does to this uh, i'm gonna call this fizz buzz normal and it's gonna build this image really quick and so just that fast it's already done and if i do docker run fizzbuzz dash normal it goes ahead and executes my fizzbuzz application just fine exactly what we expect to see we have created a go application we've actually developed a go we've containerized a go application just that easy but if i do a docker images and i look at the fizzbuzz normal it's 812 megabytes it's two more megabytes than the underlying golang container and you might say great all right well you know that's way too large like that's almost a gig in size way too big for a simple application like this seems pretty unwieldy pretty out of control um let's go ahead and modify that docker file and you might say all right well why don't we just use the alpine version of golang so um you might go to the docker hub and you might head over and you might say um let's see hub uh, docker.com you might do some research and you might say hey i know about this i know about this alpine thing i want to make it a lot smaller and we can see in here uh that there is um there's different options here but there is one for alpine and you might say all right i can grab the one for alpine um the golang one for alpine and let's see if uh if that works so we'll take this We'll give it the Alpine tag instead, and we'll try to build it with this image instead. And now I do not have this Alpine, this Alpine image locally. So when I do the build, it's gonna pull it for me. I'm gonna build it again. Uh, actually, nope. Uh, I don't think that tagged anything, did it? Uh, Cause I didn't, I didn't wanna overwrite that one. Let's, let's call it something new. Let's call this Fizzbuzz uh, Alpine. All right, so it's pulling down the Alpine container because I do not, or image, because I do not have the Alpine image locally. It's gonna pull that down for me. It's gonna build it out. And what's gonna we're gonna run it just to make sure it runs well. This buzz Alpine is what we'll run this time, this image. And our application still works, so everything is good. And if we type in Docker images, check this out. We type in Docker images and our Fizzbuzz Alpine look how much smaller this is and so 373 megabytes instead of 812 megabytes much smaller but still pretty large for a very simple application um like this uh, a very simple executable that's like two megs like why in the world is this this large pretty crazy pretty wild right okay 
This is where multi-stage Docker builds come in. Now what we can do is like, you know, it's just too big. We don't really need that. Uh, there's a lot of things that are in this container that allow Go to work, to run, but for Go, once you once you compile the executable, you don't need all those things anymore. The executable is a standalone uh, thing that can that can be executed and can run on its own. So you don't need all the extra stuff anymore. You don't need uh, the rest of the image. You only need that executable that's out of there. So um, what you can now do is now you can go down a little bit and you can have a second from. You can now have a second from here and I can start with a new base image. I can start from scratch if I wanted, but then I would have to install everything else that I needed. Uh, so I can I can start from that Alpine container, you know, no big deal. I can start from that Alpine image that is so tiny. Remember the Alpine image is 5.73 megabytes, so it's much smaller. So I can use this now as my base layer. All right, remember, I also said in the slides up here, that you could name a stage using the as keyword in the from command. So I'm gonna do that really quick. I'm gonna give this first stage a name um, and I'm gonna say Golang as, and I'm gonna call it, what uh, you can call it anything. I'm gonna call this a uh, build step. I don't know if there's any rules for naming, um, but we're about to find out. Uh, but so this, you know, this first step is going to be uh, able to be referred to as the build step phase and we can refer to that elsewhere. And so what I could then do is I can set another work directory um, and I can say, hey, my app is gonna be in slash app. So I'm gonna set a work directory here. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy and I can simply do, I can copy from, remember I said I can pull out the executable from the first uh, image, from the first build layer. Um, and so this up here is one complete kind of build thing. I'm actually gonna remove, I uh, actually don't even need, the, I'll have to remove this, um, this command here. Um, it'll get overridden even when I do it later, but I'm gonna remove this step here because I want it to uh, to just build for me. And then I'm gonna start over and I, I'm gonna start over and build something new. So actually let me put these together so that uh, we can have a clear dissemination of where we are. All right, and I'm gonna copy. I'm gonna copy from um, copy from uh, build step. So that's this is where the naming comes in. I'm gonna copy from the build step. Uh, I'm simply going to copy this file. So the file is gonna get put um, in this fizzbuzz directory and it's gonna be called fizzbuzz. And so let's, let's actually call it something different. Let's call this, uh, uh, let's call it, let's actually call it fizzbuzz app. Let's do capitals. Let's do fizz buzz app. Uh, so that's the actual executable that's gonna get built. And I'm gonna say, hey, copy from this work directory. So inside of the work directory from here, fizz buzz, uh, copy fizz buzz, fizz buzz app. Go ahead and copy that right here, right to my location right now, which is slash app. So copy from this container, copy from build step, this file and copy it right here. So I'm copy, I'm pulling that executable out of that container, out of the first stage, I'm pulling it into this stage that I'm currently in now. And here is where I can set the actual command that's gonna go ahead and run everything that needs to run. And I'm gonna say, hey, go ahead and simply run this buzz app. All right, so take a look at that for a few seconds. Just take a look wrap your eyes around it um this is the this is stage one right up here and do docker files take comments stage one comma where we build the executable all right and stage two where we copy the executable into uh, a container to run it. Now, again, Alpine is, it has everything that you need to be able to execute uh, an executable. It has just enough things in there to be able to do that. And so Alpine is the perfect use case for something like this. And so now we're gonna go ahead and run this. So it has two from lines. And every time you see more than one from line, that starts the next stage. And let's take this and let's save it.
and let's go ahead and let's do a docker build dash t uh, and let's give it a name of um what do we call the other two fizzbuzz dash uh multi-stage um multi-stage alpine doesn't really matter that actually doesn't even the first the first uh thing doesn't even matter at all but okay um and then we needed to build it right here so we're gonna let it build and you can actually see it goes through the first couple steps uh and then it has another step that's another from and it goes through and it builds this image and this is what we called it and so i'm gonna docker run this just to make sure our application works and our application works so our container is built properly our application works just as we thought it would and you know uh this means our application is running properly um so let's look at the image size and if we look at the image size the image size is 7.64 megabytes so this container does the exact same thing as this container which does the exact same thing as this container and they are massively different in sizes um and again all we did was use all the tools these are so large because they have lots of tools in them to run go it has everything you need to run go and to to process go code but once you uh write your go code and you use that you use all those massive files to execute uh to, to compile into an executable um the executable is all you need to be able to run your application we pull that executable out of that container and put it into a smaller one to just be executed and it makes it so much smaller um so much better and so maybe you might say um let's see if there's any size difference if we take off alpine and use the bigger and use the bigger first step let's see if it makes a difference i'm gonna rebuild it again i'm gonna do a docker images and it's a little bit big what i think it's a little bit bigger um i'll just stage uh, oh no, about the same. Uh, ooh, Ray Raylon, thank you. Rayulan, thank you so much for the thousand bits. Wow, I appreciate that. Um, and I'm glad, you know, I the other day I was really not confused about it, but I, I didn't, I, I didn't understand the, the, I didn't understand the use case for this besides size, but the real use case is size. The, the size, the, like the size of the container does in fact matter. And so I still be hundred percent honest with you. I don't understand. Like if, if you're not using a, and, and, uh, if your application is not using a language that can compile down into executable, I'm not sure I understand the use case. Um, I guess maybe with, if you're using like node and you're using Webpack. Um, maybe I get it, but if you're not, I'm not sure I understand the use case. Um, I'm not understanding, I'm not understanding how pulling the things out help all that much, or if they, I feel like the games would be small, but again, that might just be, I need to play with a little bit more and really understand those build processes uh, a little bit better. Can I have remote web dev job? Uh, trait CO, send me a message on LinkedIn and I think exclamation point LinkedIn. And we will see what we can do for you. Um, yeah, we'll definitely see what we can do for you. Um, my goal is to help connect people to to these jobs. Um, I'm getting, I'm getting there. I'm, I'm my my network um, of of employers is building, um, and uh, you know, I, I would love to point to you in the right direction and see see what you want to do um, and see what like who who I know and what's open right now. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to help. I'd definitely be happy to help. Um, but yeah, send me a request on LinkedIn and, and just shoot me a message on LinkedIn. But that is why multi-stage Docker files are great. Um, it helps you, it helps you be able to manage uh, your containers and images a little bit better. Uh, keeps things a little bit cleaner, um, a lot cleaner actually. Um, to be 100% honest, the more and more I spent a lot of time thinking about it uh, yesterday. Actually, I was like, all right, all right. People are using this for a reason. And I think I think one of the things is that like the, the project that I work on, there's not a ton of, um, there's not a ton of time sensitive or um, the, the orchestration is relatively light. So we don't have containers just, you know, spinning up all like, like jobs and stuff spinning up at all times. And that's where the size stuff does matter. Like 
if you're you know if you're running jobs here and there and you're running thousands of things you running kubernetes and you know you need these containers to be able to spin up real quick um you know i did this matters a lot like this is such a gigantic uh difference and i think i also didn't fully comprehend the massive size difference like i knew it was gonna be a size difference but i thought it was gonna be more like this uh rather than like this is absurd um so i will say that is pretty cool and so that's what the multi-stage will allow you to do it'll allow you to pull uh to pull the just the things you need out of a docker build out of an image uh and stick it into um, somewhere else, it, it, which essentially gets rid of all the extra stuff that you no longer need because you've already built uh, the 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 um, the what's the artifact that you need uh, to move on from where you are. But that's it. That's all I have for you today. Um, I got nothing else. Uh, so what are we t tangible takeaways uh, for today? We talked about one docker networks uh the three main docker networks we talked about were um were the host network which allows you to uh, kind of pipe everything through your host machine um we talked about the none network and we talked about the uh the bridge network which is the default network that comes out of the box then we talked a little bit about uh command versus entry point uh they can be utilized to do the exact same thing but entry point is focused on the executable and the command uh, the CMD sets the defaults. They can be overridden from the command line as well. Uh, they can be used in tandem to do some cool things. And then we talked about multi-stage Docker files, which do in fact allow you to um, to m move information through builds to be able to uh, uh, to do, have different stages where you leave behind things you no longer need uh, and only pass through the artifacts that you do need. Frosted donut. Thank you so much for the gifted subs. Thank you for the love. I do appreciate it. Everyone, please give Gift Fit Frosted Donut a, 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 a huge thank you from the bottom of your heart, just like I'm giving you one from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for all of those. Uh, it is very kind. And, you know, Mr. Frosted Donut has frosted the pockets, it seems. But I do appreciate it. Everyone, please thank Frosted Donut if you got a, a, a sub tonight. That is excellent. Um... Yeah, way to way to way to end it on the highest of notes. I do appreciate that. But that's it. Um, if you have any questions about this, you are going to get I, I, I'll just give you a little uh, a little information. Now, I will give you at the last well, the last day we're going to like I said, we're going to take an application and we are going to reverse engineer it. We're going to we're going to dockerize it. We're going to go through We're going to learn the application first and uh, we're gonna reverse engineer it and dockerize it. But I'm also gonna give you a number of like um, scenarios to go dockerize some other, to try, to try some other things. I, I did my best to like try to get these like, not scenarios together, but like docker practice things uh, that are kind of real world. Uh, so there are about 10 of them. I'll give them to you in GitHub um, that you can kind of just go try to practice these skills uh, and you can have a lot of freedom in trying to figure out how to figure out how to achieve each of these things, um, but it should be pretty pretty fun. Was able to follow along, uh, do everything in Windows and PowerShell. That's awesome. That's great. That's great. Thank you for the kind words about the awesome stream. Even got JQ working in PowerShell. Dope. I'm telling you, JQ. If you ever need to mess with JSON, like I said, I I help uh, with a JavaScript project. If you're messing with JSON, JQ is like the best. It is the best. Bob Moff. Unfortunately, uh, yeah, 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 one, thank you for the follow. Good to have you, but you just missed everything that we did here. We just uh, talked about uh, Docker networking. We talked about Docker uh, command versus entry point and Docker multi-stage builds tonight. Uh, but we will be back on Tuesday. We'll be back on Tuesday with uh, um, multiple container uh, setups, uh, Docker, where we learning Docker Compose uh, and kind of understanding how Docker containers interact with each other. So the applications needing multiple uh, applications, uh, different tools and pieces can talk to each other and can work together, but we'll also be using Docker Compose to be able to spin those things up as well. WACQ is also for YAML. I've never used that, but now we'll check it out because I write a lot of YAML. I'll write a whole lot of YAML. But yeah, so we'll be back on Tuesday for this. Um, We'll be back on Monday for Waddle. Um, what are we doing on Waddle on Monday? Uh, which is our Linux Foundations course. 
um we are going to be doing uh learning about system startup stuff so we're gonna be learning about run levels we're gonna be learning about um you know a check config and making sure things start up properly when you uh when you start up the computer and understanding what happens during the startup process of a linux machine we'll be talking about cron and setting up some cron jobs and talking about how you can utilize that to solve some problems and we'll be learning some linux networking concepts so uh, we did a little bit of networking tonight we'll be learning um some linux networking concepts next time as well and then we're going to finish it off with a bash scripting lab so come through if you need a little bit of a linux love but gave you five minutes of your night back let's see who we're going to head over and raid tonight let's check out the science and technology channel who do we have who do we have um let's see Neo Vim plugin. Oh, we, we, I think we did try to get some new. I'm trying to get different people, but also like still give people we know and we love uh, the love as well. Um, let's head back up. Who's uh, who's up here? Code show. I've never. I don't think we've ever done code show. Doing some Rust. I like that because I like Rust. But is this a? Is this English? Uh, sure. Let's head over to do that. Let's, let's head over to Code Show. But thanks everyone for the great stream. Uh, what's the colorized output use case? Yeah, just easier to read. I, for me, it's easier to read a lot. Uh, I love it. We're gonna raid over to Code Show. All right, we're out of here, and I'm gonna finally get the countdown right because we're going away in us, you know, a six, five, four, three, two, one. Everyone have a great night. See you next week. Peace.